Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin, ex-KGB agent and current president of Russia. He's a man of great power and a ruthless man who will do anything to ensure he remains in power as the head of the Russian government, possibly even murder hundreds of his own people. It's been said that Russia is not a failing democracy but rather a successful autocracy, and Vladimir Putin is at the reins of the world's most powerful autocratic state. Under his watch, hundreds of Russians have been murdered, political opponents jailed, and whistleblowers assassinated. While the pockets of organized crime and major political figures have been enriched greatly to the point that Russia now has one of the world's greatest wealth inequalities amongst industrialized nations. Putin grew up in a small apartment in then Leningrad, today St. Petersburg. His family was working class, which in the Soviet Union made them very poor. From his earliest years, Putin is fond of retelling one particular story. Once he and his mother had cornered a rat, and knowing it was cornered, the rat became vicious and extremely dangerous. It's a fitting story for a man who has clawed his way out of many corners in his life. When he was about 17, Putin approached the local KGB desk and asked to join. He was told to return when he was older, and so Putin enrolled in Leningrad State University to pursue a law degree, and there he met Anatoly Sobchak who was at the time an assistant professor teaching business law. The two would make an impression on each other, and Sobchak would later be instrumental in creating the Putin we know today. Putin for his part would be instrumental in keeping Sobchak out of life imprisonment. In 1975, Putin joined the KGB and was sent for training at the 401st KGB school in Okta, Leningrad. After training, he worked in the 2nd Chief Directorate, undertaking counterintelligence operations, and was eventually transferred to the 1st Chief Directorate where he would be tasked with monitoring foreign officials in Leningrad. For the KGB, this meant not just keeping tabs on potential spies, but also running surveillance and discovering any potential opportunities for blackmail or exploitation. This is likely where Putin gained his infamous ability to read individuals, with many of his supporters and critics alike confirming that the man has an uncanny ability to discern an individual's true motives. This is also what made him a successful intelligence agent, and Putin was soon sent to the front line in the US-Soviet intelligence war, East Germany. Putin would serve in Dresden from 1985 to 1990, gradually growing more and more disillusioned with the state of affairs in the Soviet Union and hardening his attitude toward the West, whom he saw as responsible for the decline of the Soviet state. Very little is known about Putin's exact activities during this time period, but many former terror group members and intelligence agents from both Russia and Western nations have come forward with various claims. It's widely believed that Putin had a direct role in contact and arming terrorist groups that the Soviet Union saw as useful such as the Red Army faction and various neo-Nazi movements. Putin was believed to be responsible for coordinating some of their activities and even providing funding or equipment. His knack for developing contacts with the criminal underground would serve him very well when the Soviet Union began to fall apart around him. In 1990, as the East German Communist government fell, Putin returned to Leningrad to work with the International Affairs section of Leningrad State University. While there, he surveilled the student body for any signs of dissident activity, while also looking for potential KGB recruits. His return to Leningrad also afforded him the opportunity to reconnect with former professor Anatoly Sobchak, a relationship which soon would blossom into a full-fledged criminal partnership. As the 1991 coup against Mikhail Gorbachev played out, Putin saw where the chips were landing and resigned from the KGB. In 1991, Putin became head of the Committee for External Relations of the Mayor's Office, a position he gained through his relationship with Anatoly Sobchak who had become St. Petersburg's first democratically elected mayor. Almost immediately, allegations of corruption began to crop up against Putin and his master Sobchak, as claimed by investigative journalists and police and federal investigators who were all later silenced in one fashion or another. Putin had used his old KGB tricks to make contacts with the criminal underworld. St. Petersburg at the time was known as the mafia capital of Russia, and no mayor could rule the city without organized crime's approval. It's not known how many millions Putin helped Sobchak embezzle from the city, but one investigation discovered that Putin had been responsible for the exchange of $93 million in medals for food aid from the West. Only the promised food never arrived in any significant quantity. It's believed that the food was funneled directly to the underground markets popular throughout Russia during this time, with Putin, Sobchak, and organized crime all enriching their pockets. The investigation into the missing food aid ended with a recommendation that Putin be immediately fired but Sobchak summarily ignored it. Soon though, Sobchak's corruption became too much for St. Petersburg to stomach, and he lost his re-election campaign in 1996. With pressure mounting to arrest Sobchak and try him for corruption, Putin helped Sobchak orchestrate a stunt involving his alleged failing health, delaying any potential court proceedings. Sobchak arranged for medical treatment in Paris and left Russia with no return passport. 
Upon landing in Paris, Sobchak did not check into the hospital or seek treatment, instead living in exile until his old friend Vladimir Putin became powerful enough to invite him back home and pressure authorities to drop the charges against him. Putin's fierce loyalty to the corrupt Sobchak and his engineering of Sobchak's evasion of criminal charges, however, immediately caught the attention of then-President Boris Yeltsin. Yeltsin had himself caught the attention of a growing number of federal prosecutors as criminal scheme after criminal scheme was uncovered within Yeltsin's inner circle. While the Russian people struggled with skyrocketing wealth inequality, Yeltsin had used his presidency to greatly enrich himself and a growing number of wealthy oligarchs, whose loyalty in turn fueled Yeltsin's political power. Yeltsin's presidency was winding down and he needed an ace in the hole to make sure he stayed out of prison. Vladimir Putin would be that ace. Seeing his display of loyalty to Sobchak, Yeltsin invited Putin to Moscow and within two years was appointed Prime Minister of the Russian Federation. Upon his appointment, Yeltsin also commented that he wished to see Putin become a successor. There was just one problem. Nobody knew who Putin was. With a complete unknown in contention for the presidency, Yeltsin's opponents knew they had all but clenched the presidency for themselves. They never counted on just how many Russian lives Putin was willing to sacrifice to seize power. In September 1999, a series of bombings struck the city of Boynaksk, Moscow, and Volgodosink. The attacks were carried out by Chechen terrorists and killed 300 innocent Russians while injuring over a thousand more. The entire country was shocked by the violence of the attacks, and the Russian people became terrified as the targets had all been apartment buildings. Any one of them could be next. Vladimir Putin, Russia's prime minister, swore vengeance on the perpetrators, and soon the Russian intelligence services had pinned the attacks on Chechen terrorists. The Russian military mobilized and the Second Chechen War was on. Vladimir Putin's tough stance and even tougher actions soon made him a national hero, and the presidency was inevitably his to win. There was just one problem. The attacks were almost certainly either fully or in large part a Russian false flag operation. After the main wave of attacks, another explosive was located on the 22nd of September by a resident of an apartment building in Ryazan. The witnesses noticed two suspicious men carrying sacks into the basement from a car with the car's license plate being registered in Moscow but with a sheet of paper covering the last two digits. The police discovered three sacks of white powder in the basement with a detonator and timing device attached to the sacks. After the bomb squad defused the explosives, the police officers would state that the detonator was of professional grade. Even more damning was the fact that the explosive discovered would turn out to be the same type of explosive used by the Russian military. Putin's government would go on to deny any involvement in the plot, and yet numerous investigations carried out by both foreign and Russian intelligence agencies would all refuse to release their findings. Even more damning is the fact that many journalists and investigators looking into the bombings in the years to come would end up dead. In 2003, U.S. Senator John McCain warned Congress that there remain credible allegations that Russia's Federal Security Service had a hand in carrying out these attacks. Alexander Litvinenko, a former KGB officer, would go public with his allegations that Putin had in fact ordered the apartment building attacks, amongst other charges of crimes and corruption of the by now president of the Russian Federation. Litvinenko would end up dead, poisoned in London with a radioactive substance by two Russian intelligence agents. In the end, despite much of the Russian population believing the government had something to do with the attacks, the immediate effect was just as Putin had planned. His stirring leadership and tough guy stance against the Chechen people would spur him into Russia's highest office. While there, he would work to change presidential term limits while consolidating his political power. He briefly stepped down from the presidency to become prime minister again in 2008, only to ascend to power a third time in 2012. In 2021, Putin signed into law an expansion to Russian presidential term limits, giving him two more chances to run and potentially putting him in power until 2036. With any major political opponent frequently being intimidated, killed, or simply arrested for any number of trumped-up charges, Putin is set to remain in power as Russia's most successful dictator since Joseph Stalin. Putin's key to power has been consolidating his political base by forcing out any potential rivals. He's closely worked with contacts in the organized crime world to intimidate, harass, and even murder any potential opponents who don't fall in line, and reporters in Russia who dig too deep into Putin's presidency often find themselves imprisoned under false charges or simply killed. Briefly in the 2000s, Russia was considered one of the most dangerous places for an independent journalist to operate. Since then, the only thing that's changed is fewer reporters are left who are willing to risk their lives or freedom to tackle Putin's corruption. To placate the Russian people and garner support, Putin has a long stock to his tough guy persona. A favorite tactic of his are ridiculous propaganda-style photo shoots where he's depicted as a tough, manly man who engages in sports from hockey to fishing shirtless to riding horses, also shirtless, and maintaining a physical fitness regime even at the age of 69. 
A man of many talents, though, Putin is also frequently shown to have an intellectual side, with photos depicting him joining an underwater archaeological expedition and being a man of action and adventure as he drives a Formula One race car. However, what Putin most wants is the Russian people to know that he's a man of heart as well, as he hosts a tea party for a little girl with cancer and helps conduct research into polar bears. Then there's that time that Putin rode a weasel that was riding a woodpecker. By all accounts, Putin is so beloved by the Russian people that he's the only world leader with his own music video, with women clamoring for their own man like Putin. The truth is, though, it's all propaganda meant to keep Putin in power. Now go check out A Day in the Life of Putin or click this other video instead.